Greetings, everybody. My name is Beth Angel. Um, I am the Dean of the School, if you don't happen to know me yet. And I am so thrilled to welcome all of you to our Community Engagement Showcase event. And um, so just by way of a little bit of background, um, uh, Engage and, and our Community Engagement Office in general were, have been a signature initiative of the school over the last few years. We're part of our last strategic plan, which started in 2017 and was completed in 2021. And one of the contributions of that plan, well, <laughs> another signature initiative is that we're doing renovations right now. <laughs> and that's what you're hearing all around you. Um, so, so anyway, we're really, really proud of the infrastructure that we have developed around community engagement, because while it's always been a value of our school and really of our profession, um, the establishing an office of community engagement has allowed us to really center it and to center it as part of our mission and to create visibility around the efforts that our community is doing. And so that's why today is so special because we're gonna really get an opportunity. We all know it's important. We all know we're doing it, but you're gonna find out how we're doing it and what kind of impact it's making as we hear from um, different uh, members of the school who have been involved in these initiatives. So um, I really wanna give a very, very special thanks to the Engage team and a special shout out because I'm there, she's going to take the podium after me to Trina Shanks, who is our director of community engagement for the school. And um, Trina will introduce today's events. So, thank you, Trina. All righty. Thank you, Dean Angel. I'm going to spend about three minutes talking about Engage because I know what you really want to do is hear all the presentations, right? So, um, we really promote student and faculty engagement in the school, and we really focus on social justice issues. Probably you know us because of our webinar that comes play once a month, and so you see all those great topics that we come up with. But we really want to facilitate student learning and support community engagement efforts across the school. And so inside the school, we have showcases like this to, um, to showcase faculty student engagement. We actually try to inventory all the things that the school does in the city um, of Ann Arbor and um, Detroit and other places. Um, and then we may include Office of Global Activities throughout the world. Um, and we also do small engagement grants to faculty who want to do projects about $5,000. And you hear about some of those today. And then we also try to implement curriculum innovation, trying to figure out how can we bring more community engagement to our classes. And then in the community, we want to connect social justice, um, justice movements to the school and facilitate community-based um, social impact initiatives and provide technical assistance to community-based organizations. So if there's things that we can help them with or help them grow with, and we actually do a lot of work around things like workforce development. Um, and then this is our team. So me, I'm Trina Shanks. Um, Sonia Harb is here. Um, Aisha Ghazi, Edwin isn't here, but she helps lead the webinar series. Fatima Salman is here. Um, Saria isn't here today because she's sick, but she did almost all the work to get this organized. So give her a round of applause in her absence. And then our student in, uh, intern, Parker um, Kerrig, is online and she's going to be monitoring. The, they are going to be monitoring the chat. And so we're really grateful for all they've been able to bring to our team. Um, and so now we go to the agenda for today. I'm going to bring it over to Fatima, who's going to MC tonight, and we get to learn about all the wonderful things that are happening across the community, across the school. So thanks, everybody, for coming. I know everybody's enjoying the food. I keep on hearing it. So enjoy the food. The rice pudding is still warm, so you might want to go grab that. So thank you all for coming. Um, as social workers, we pivot. And so Saria was supposed to be our MC for the day and she's not here and we're really upset because we all wanted you all to meet her too. She's our newest team member and a fantastic addition, in fact, to our group. So um, without further ado, we have some incredible people that are gonna be talking about what they do in the community and um, we're excited to hear them. So the first is actually gonna be a virtual presentation. Um, Jenica, and I don't know why my picture is here and I'm there, it's like, this weird, like we're in two places at the same time. Um, but Jenica is online. Oh, you're here. Oh, okay. No, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Prince. Okay, Doc, yeah, Dr. Devadas is online. So Saria is online. I'm seeing if you could open up the mic, Saria. Dr. Solomon, are you here? Yeah, I'm very much here. 
Oh, there we are. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming today. Well, obviously, you still have to come. But um, my name is Janica Scott. I am an MSW23 intern. Um, not intern, graduating in the next few months. Online, we have Dr. Solomon um, from Madras Christian College. And today, we'll be presenting on um, the field action program that is based off of the Department of Social Work in Chennai. So... Let's get started. This is a, just a really cool uh, one of the um, places that uh, one of the temples that are there is just so magnificent. Um, but yeah, we can get started. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Dr. Solomon, do you want to take this over? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to just have a quick presentation on the field action project. So the field action project is a unique uh, uh, project that the Department of Social Work, Madras Christian College is uh, uh, literally adopted uh, during the floods in 2015. Uh, so we all know that we have to go for field placements. So uh, during the floods uh, in Chennai in 2015, uh, we did do outreach as a department. We went out and uh, reached out to people, especially the vulnerable uh, people. And uh, one of the groups that we met was a uh, a group uh, called Iruler. Uh, Iruler are a tribal group. You call them the natives, so we call the use the word tribe. So they uh, are uh, they are called the PVTG, particularly vulnerable tribal group. Um, so they belong to um, a particular a group of tribe, which are uh, usually the most backward of the tribal. We have around four hundred and twenty different tribal communities in India. And out of that, they are considered to be the most backward. So we have started to work directly as a department. So we place our students uh, for placement uh, directly in the community without an agency. So we call it also the direct placement. Uh, so Jenica Scott was part of that. Uh, she was uh, interning for 12 weeks here in the department. And uh, she was directly involved in uh, this placement, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the initiatives that we have taken uh, before and during the time when uh, Jenica uh, was working with us. So uh, this is a purely an advocacy model uh, where uh, we stand in between the people and uh, the 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 benefit the the government, especially uh, for land, for water, portable water. Uh, for housing, um, for electricity. Most of them don't have electricity. And uh, at last but not the least, the education for the children, because there are several uh, child marriages that are still uh, being practiced here. So which is something that, uh, um, you know, that really stops the, the, the flow of uh, the community being developed uh, further. So uh, with that, I just want to introduce this project in case if you are wondering what this is all about. Uh, next year, the Office of the Global Engagement is uh, looking out. I think we are looking out for a, um, a study trip to India. So in case if some of you are listening to this, uh, you are most welcome to India and you'll be part of this. Over to Jenica. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so we could go to the next slide. I'll be very quick because I know I have two minutes. So really quickly, um, this is just like some of the initiatives that uh, that we've taken, as Dr. Solomon correctly stated, that we mostly go into the tribal communities. So in the the first picture where you see like a lot of grass, that's actually a rice field. So many of the tribes live way beyond outreach. So we have to go through the rice fields to the um, places where they live. Those are examples of their houses. Um, of course, they do not own land. So that's why we go there. We try to at least have them to like put tarpaulins on their houses because, you know, when it rains, it pours and when it pours, it floods. Um, like when it comes to water. So we basically do a needs assessment and to be able to find out what their basic needs by family with regards to light, water, housing, um, making sure that the kids get into schools, making sure that they have um, access to health benefits and like signing up them for those kind of programs. Um, my role also entail like doing a survey, a community um, research survey. So that's what you see in the top um, corner there 
with the women. So we we did a, a qualitative um, a qualitative survey to make sure that they understand basically what their needs are, what are the challenges, and like how best we can go forward with the program in the future. Could go to the next slide. So sorry, I'm rushing. Yeah, one minute. Okay. So yeah, the impact and the outcome. Of course, the direct impact is mostly um, the fact that they're able to get those immediate needs, access to water. Um, a good roof on their on over their heads, making sure that they have that access to like benef the kids go to school, they have land entitlement. Personally and professionally, it really allowed me to be able to be more culturally sensitive towards the needs of other communities, other ethnicities, um, to be able to do a needs assessment and to be able to um to do research on a larger level, on an international level. So that was really great. Um, the next slide. So the challenges, of course, it would be mostly just navigating the space, getting funding, getting government officials to be on board with it. Um, so what we've done, I've tried to like create a, like a website so that to, to gain more traction, um, to be able to evaluate impact. So that is currently another project that is underway. And of course, you know, managing that emotional toll of seeing people in a um, in a very um, oppressive state and wanting to do most, but you could only do what you can do in the space, but making sure that you empower and create less harm. And finally, could go to the last slide. <laughs> Future impact, of course, for the program would be continued involvement within that community. Um, within um, India, it would be expanding this program more to other districts because as Professor said, there's a lot of tribal communities that would need it. And of course, advocate for more um, impact data collection and to get grants to continue with that funding. But that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we already, the engaged team has already decided that we're going to go to India with you. My mom is there right now, actually, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll just go to, um, with them. Thank you so much. Just so everybody knows, these everything that's going to be presented today, you can already tell, is amazing stuff. So what we'll do is for anybody that's attended, we'll also send contact information out for everybody that's presenting. So if you do want to get more information, learn more about it, uh, you'll have their contact information. Our next uh, presenter is, thank you, Dr. Solomon. We appreciate you. Um, our next presenter is Stephanie Acosta, who is online. Stephanie, you're just going to have to unmute yourself. Um, and then once you start talking, you should. Well, sorry if you could um, highlight Stephanie online. Hi, I am here. Awesome. And so uh, the presentation is virtual case management for refugees. We see you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I, before I get started, am I sharing my screen or are you? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the School of Social Work for the invitation. Uh, my name is Stephanie Acosta. I am based in El Paso, Texas, um, and I am excited to share with you all my work through my field placement opportunity as an online student uh, on the interpersonal inter practice pathway, um, I am able to participate in the IRC's virtual case management program as part of my, my field work. Um, so I do get to do this from El Paso, Texas, uh, just to share with you where I'm joining from. Um, I am um, in my home and uh, El Paso is located on the border plex region on the border with Las Cruces, New Mexico, and with Ciudad Juarez, state of Chihuahua, along the U.S.-Mexico border. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to share the work that I'm doing online for refugees uh, actually across the country in the U.S. And so just for some context setting, wanted to share with you the communities and the population that uh, that we're working with as part of this virtual case management program. When we um, refer and talk about refugees, um, this is a definition um, that is designated by the UN and the communities that we serve are those that have been provided refugee status. And this is a person who has left their home and cannot return to their home country due to a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, 
or political opinion. There are uh, very extensive processes for refugees to go through in order to be designated refugee status. This is generally determined by a refugee agency such as UNHCR. Um, they go through many layers of interviews, security checks before being approved for entry into the U.S. And once refugees are accepted for resettlement through the U.N. Refugee Admissions Program, then they become eligible for services by a resettlement agency such as the IRC. Other terms that I just want to share for context setting that I think we often um, uh, see, uh, particularly in this uh, moment uh, in the U.S., is also talking about migrants and asylum seekers. Those um, communities are defined under certain other definitions, but um, for an example, a migrant is provided by IOM, the International Office of Migration, is an umbrella term, it does not have um, a definition under international law, but we're talking about people who move from their place of residence, could be within a country or across international borders uh, temporarily or permanently for a variety of reasons. And when we uh, work with asylum seekers, um, just again for brevity, um, an asylum seeker is someone who is also seeking international protections from dangers in their home country, but whose claim for refugee status has not been yet determined legally. Um, and they must be able to approve to authorities that they can meet this criteria covered by refugee protections. Not every asylum seeker will be recognized as a refugee, but I want to be able to uh, just share this with you all. On the next slide, I will proceed with what is virtual case management? So this is a new program um, developed by the IRC where we provide up to six months of remote case management for clients who reside outside of a local IRC office. So there's over 20 offices across the country and we're here to ensure that our clients receive uh, all of the services that uh, they deserve and they may need for resettlement into the US. Next slide, please. So here are some common services and some of the work that I am doing in field placement. We support our clients with housing, economic empowerment, initial health screenings, and power client advocacy. And again, this is all in accompaniment with the refugee. We uh, follow a strengths-based approach, which I'm going to share also in the next slide. I'm getting a half a one-minute um, warning here. But we really uh, follow this approach as we recognize this basic premise that everyone has their inherent strengths and assets to allow them to cope um, with stress, with trauma, with um, their day daily lives. And so we're here to be with our clients and identify their needs and work with them towards their goals that they have identified uh, through this program. Next slide, please. I just wanted to end on this note. Um, there are over 20 million refugees in the world. And the reality is that with the international community's capacity, only 1% are considered for resettlement worldwide. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. And um, really grateful that as a social worker, we have this role and profession and uh, contributions that we can make in this space. So. There's a lot of work ahead of us, but um, I think that our profession can really make a great contribution for for refugees for worldwide. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and so now we're going to move over to our in-person portion, and we have Nikki Williams. I'm not going to lie, I'm excited for this. Um, he is representing the D. His presentation is called Detroiter. Um, when we saw Nikki had uh, submitted, we got really excited. Um, I'm not like true story. I was like, oh my God, Nikki pre is, is presenting. So do you want this or do you want Sure. This? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey everyone, I'm Nikki. I'm part of the communications team. And um, yeah, so you guys know me from that. But uh, when I'm not here, I'm living in Detroit and riding my bike around. And I've been working on a project for the last three months that is led by chance and wandering. 
and um, meeting people and seducing them into letting me take their photo. And uh, something that's always on my mind is this quote by Diane Arbus, uh, who we have in the collection here. What is ceremonious and curious and commonplace will be legendary. So I go to all sorts of ceremonies, like peewee football and um, whatever I find when I'm riding around. Photography as a medium has only really been around for 200 years. So it's very like shallow, right? Like it's not as long of a history as something as painting. Yet, even though it's been around for so little time, it's very ubiquitous in how we see image and how we perceive each other as people and human beings. And so um, it's just on my mind as I'm entering these projects. I do um, all sorts of photography outside of work, um, editorial, um, you know, photographing things like Michigan Elvis Fest or uh, Hearst Fest or um, the UAW strikes. I've been making portraits of folks on the line. And so this work, it all feeds back into each other. Um, when I'm on the streets, I'm just riding around. If I see someone, I approach them and I say, hey, can I make your photo? And they're like, how much will it cost? And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is really for me. Um, I'll even text you the photo afterwards. So all these photos that I've made have been given to the person that um, have been photographed. Uh, unless they don't have a phone or a number, there's plenty of people living on the margins in Detroit. And um, every day when I come home from a shoot, I journal about that and the stories they've told me. And uh, that's all going to be eventually compiled into a book um, documenting the 21st century of Detroit. Um so there's this is like a photograph from a from a carnival going on, a uh, photograph from the skate park with this amazing dog. <laughs> His mom was not pleased that I was photographing her son, and she came over and wondered what I was doing. But he was really into it, which is funny. Um, yeah, there's this is Dennis the Cane Man. He creates these canes out of uh, riverwood, which he chops down off the banks of the Detroit River. And uh, when we were taking this photo outside of Chase Bank, a security guard came out and told us that we weren't allowed to stand on the sidewalk simply probably because how Dennis looked. I mean, I don't get a lot of commentary going around Detroit in the identity that I have. Um, I slide through unnoticed. There's uh, plenty of cookouts in Detroit. This is in Palmer Park. This is Maria. She works at Elk Club <laughs> and, and uh, her dog. <laughs> Um, the key to accessing people really is this family photo album that I carry with me. It's got tons of portraits of people I've made. Um, I've been working on this work for like three months. And so I've probably photographed over 150 people so far. Um, but people are skeptical of you at first. They don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it. I don't know why I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, I'm just... I'm uh, letting it guide me, the work guide me. It's been very early on in the process so far. Um, yeah, one of my favorite places to stop is the Cass bus station, the Rosa Parks bus station. People are usually waiting around and are easy to talk to. And it takes time. I set up these lights, um, get people to pose. Immediately, everyone wants to smile or do want to, like, like that, and I, you know, you gotta be like, okay, just look at me or look over there. You know, to talk as you talk, you get deeper into different situations and different poses. This is Karate Joe. He has an amazing karate kick, but. This was in the middle of the jazz fest and he was drunk and he was running into people as well. So some, it's all on the streets. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of frenetic energy. Uh, Detroit's really fun. Um, outside of a concert at Aretha Franklin. This is just across the street from my house. I have a horrible memory too. So all these names are written down, but I can't just like blab off everyone's name, unfortunately, right now. Mr. Wilson, um, he 
said he recognized me from something that never happened in reality, which he said that it was raining. We were at an emergency room. I had the phone and was able to contact his lawyer. And um, I wonder if that will one day occur or not, or if it's just a dream or a nightmare. This photo is uh, really important to me because uh, Wayne was at the bus station uh, and when I asked to photograph him, he said why. He's very, he felt very ugly and um, felt that his vitiligo was off-putting and told me that he had been made fun of for it in the past. But um, he took a chance on me to make the portrait and when I sent it to him later, he was like really blown away uh, and excited and we, we're planning more shoots together. Um, as he gets, he wants to do it in more of like his outfit, different outfits he has at home and stuff. So that's a cool, it's like always nice. I mean, to send the photos to everyone. Um, sometimes I don't get a response. Oftentimes I get a positive response. Um, that keeps me going because it's like, you know, it's nice to, nice to hear from people. And uh, eventually this will probably be compiled into a book um, or perhaps printed really, really, really big and put on some wall. Um, you know, there's all sorts of notions of power within photography and it's definitely a privilege to every time I get to photograph someone, it's a privilege for me. And they're, they're giving you something. They're giving you a lot. Especially, I'm a very, I'm pretty demanding. Where are we on time? One minute. Okay, for sure. One minute left. Cool. Yes. So it's a final quote that I think about uh, a lot as well. Alone on the stage of the photograph, we act out dreams and nightmares, donning this or that persona, offering ourselves up to the lens and passive eye. In doing so, we strive to make the apparatus complicit in our desires. The self depicted is neither true nor false, but possible, potential. The image provides a meeting ground for the mirroring deceptions of the medium and the pose in all, all its conditionality and its self-assurance and paradox. The photograph forms a membrane between here and there, now and then, real and imaginary, hope and fear between self and shadow. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Nikki. I think that was very beautiful. Um, can't wait for the book. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so now we have Gizam Kastli, who is going to be presenting on her presentation, Peer to Peer. And we're going to give you this, so you can just go ahead and advance yourself. Okay, and so do you want the handheld or the... This is fine. Cool. Okay. Um, I am super excited to be here today. And I know I got a time limit, so I'm going to get going. Um, okay, so my name is Gizam Kesley, and I am a part-time Master Track student on the management and leadership track. Um, I have been actually volunteering with Nami Washtana for the past six years or so, and today I'm, I'm here to talk to you about Nami Washtana and specifically our peer-to-peer -peer program. So, here we go. So NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and it is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by a mental health condition. It, it started as a small group of families gathered around the kitchen table in 1979 and blossomed into the nation's leading voice on mental health. So peer to peer. Um, this is a free educational program for adults, so people who are over the age of 18, 
um, who live with a mental health condition. This class takes place over the course of eight years, and we meet for two hours every week. And um, it provides the participants with education, skills, and support to enhance their lives. Participants learn how to strengthen their relationships and balance changing healthcare needs and better understand their mental health and their recovery. So NAMI Peer to Peer is facilitated by peers, hence our name, and we are all trained peers who make mental health and wellness a priority in our daily lives. We share information, facilitate discussions, and teach participants um, coping skills and strategies that are highlighted in the curriculum. So I do want to note that there are no official diagnoses required to be a part of the program as access to getting a diagnosis could vary across different populations. But we um, try to make sure that everybody has symptoms or conditions that affect their daily lives. So um, just to give you some context, this is a national program and we are all trained so that uh, we follow fidelity and it's instructed in the same way. And um, currently, as of 2023, there are 36 states offering this program. Michigan and NAMI Washtenaw is one of them. And about 2,600 people on average in a year graduate from the program. So a little bit about the curriculum. Um, in class one, we present a variety of viewpoints and talk about recovery. In class two, we talk about brain and the body and um, how all of this impacts our mental health and start talking about some SMART goals. In class three, thank you. Um, we talk about our personal stories and use, um, we do a progressive relaxation technique. And the next one, we talk about I statements and different communication skills. And then we move into growing our support networks. And um, we do different activities in class six around awareness grid and multi-step goals. And, you know, um, class eight wraps up with problem solving techniques and kind of revisiting vision statements. So our our whole goal in this program is to invite people to focus on their strengths and to give the message that you are not alone living with a mental health condition and you can live um, a joyful, successful life while living with a mental health condition. So here are our numbers for our current affiliates. Um, I do want you to keep in mind that every participant lives with a mental health condition and, you know, it fluctuates the ups and downs. So retention is a big problem and we try to build incentives into our program so that um, we try to combat that a little bit. And since I'm running out of time, here are some direct quotes from some of our past graduates and what they are saying. And to wrap up, I just want to share with you that I found this local organization seven years ago when I randomly searched for a mental health organization near me, and it has changed my life. That is why I volunteer, I am involved, and I oversee this program and the Washington Affiliates. We are always looking for people like all of you who care, and um, we are always interested for more volunteers, more board members, more leaders, so we can increase and um, even further our impact. And that is all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, the reason why I love being a social worker is also because other social workers have so much passion when they speak. And it's it's like same, you know, like people go and volunteer for something that they cared about and that's just who we are, right? Um, so the next presentation is to people in person. We have Tabitha Reynolds and Kathleen Clancy, and they're going to be talking about summer works. And the clicker is up here. And you want you want the mic? Yeah. Um, you got the no no wrong one. Hi everyone, happy Wednesday. Feeling good? Heck yeah, awesome. Well, my name is Tabitha Reynolds, and I'm so excited to talk to you all today about SummerWorks. I'm joined by my fabulous colleague, Kathleen. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Clancy. I am the SummerWorks program manager. 
All right, so I'm going to give a quick program overview. Um, so we are a summer youth employment program in Washtenaw County. We are a public private collaborative. And so we have four foundational partners. Um, and so first we have Michigan Work Southeast. Um, and so they are our local workforce development agency. Um, U of M Poverty Solutions within the Ford School. Um, we work with Washtenaw County Office of Community and Economic Development. And then we also work with Michigan Rehabilitation Services to help us support our young adults with disabilities. And so, as I mentioned, we are a summer youth employment program. Um, and so we are focused on promoting equity in the workforce development. And is this working? It's coming in and out. Okay. Just... Um, and so we are also focused on promoting economic mobility through workforce development. And so we have a 13 week professional development curriculum um, that helps prepare young folks for. No, this way, this way. Okay, um, that helps prepare our young adults uh, to enter the workforce. And then we have a 10 week paid internship um, and a 10 week mentorship curriculum that creates a supportive environment so that what may be their first uh, work experience or the start of their professional career that they have a supportive environment through our program staff, um, as well as our many partners that we work with. Um, that, that slide, oh. Okay, there were two different slides. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we have our foundational partners, but we also have partners um, who help us administrate our program through HR and payroll and things like that. Um, we have funders, so we are founded, funded by the Wilson Foundation, as well as Ann Arbor Spark through the Local Development Finance Authority. Um, and then our employers and mentors are really the meat of our program. They're interacting with our young adults day to day and make the experience what it is for them. And then we have our professional development speakers that come and help us facilitate our, our sessions. We like to bring in experts uh, to talk about many different things. And so all of these people come together to make our, our program happen. So the main way that we try to engage our community is to by collecting constant feedback um, and evaluating our program to make sure that we're actually creating a program that's for our youth rather than on our youth. Um, so we do that through pre and post program surveys, through attrition surveys for youth who are unable to complete the program, exit ticket surveys that are administered after every single professional development session. And then we also have one-on-one -on -one check-ins that are mandatory for our employers and our young adults, but are offered continuously throughout the summer on an optional basis. And then we provide also post pro we facilitate, excuse me, post-program focus groups so we can grab some qualitative data just to see that we're serving our folks. Um, and just some examples of the ways that we've been able to um, put that feedback back into the program and really make it catered to our young adults and the rest of our sub-communities is we've shifted from a group mentorship to an opt-in individual mentorship coming up in 2024. We've got a mentorship curriculum guide uh, that we offer to our mentors to provide them with support. We've expanded our social identity examples and our DEI curriculum. And anyone here who works with youth know they love the snacks. So we make sure we keep our snacks packed and stocked up for our sessions. Um, and then we also have just incorporated more professional development engagement opportunities during our professional development sessions. So Kahoot! polls, think pair shares, just giving them an opportunity to engage in their learning. And then one final note on community engagement. This is really about building community. Community engagement is best done when you, when you join in your community and their joys, their wins, and their struggles, um, and you really buy in and become a part of that community in whatever way is possible. All right, so thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Um, our contact information is up here, and I also just want to plug Michigan Works real quick. Um, they do really great things, and it's across the state. Um, so no matter where you are, there's a Michigan Works agency um, near you, and so you can find more information at michiganworks.org. Um, and special thanks to Tabitha. She has been an amazing um, addition to our team, and she is graduating, and we're very proud of her. So oh, kids like snacks and so do adults actually. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Our next presentation is Rehana Najafi Kupai and 
She is going to be talking about the Iranian house of Shahrade. Hi, everyone. My name is Ray Hane, and I'm an MSW student at the School of Social Work, and my pathways are IP and community change here. So um, I have been a member of Imam Ali Society since 2019. Oh, I see that. Okay. Is it this one? And um, in Imam Ali society, we seek a just and peaceful world through uh, focusing on marginalized communities, especially child laborers and single moms. And our code of ethics value equity and equality, human rights, global peace and sustainability. Imam Ali Society is a nonprofit and non-governmental organization, which was established in 1999. This organization has been a member of UN Economic and Social Council since 2010, and we mostly focus on Middle Eastern countries and more specifically Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan citizens. We hope to overcome poverty, substance abuse, and uh, provide fair and equitable housing, education, and healthcare to child laborers and their families, single mothers, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, as well as young individuals who had some confrontations with the criminal justice system. And uh, members or volunteers of Imam Ali Society are mostly undergraduate and graduate students from all over the country, Iran, and they work in one of many Iranian houses in different cities. We have different programs and hold various events for our children in, in Iranian House of Shahrari. Some of our most popular events are Iranian New Year and Kuchegardane Ashik. Iranian New Year, in, for Iranian New Year, all of our children um, would have a specific amount of money and provided by, by our donators. And then we go shopping together and they usually shop new clothes for the New Year. And through Kuche Gardana Asher, every year we use this opportunity to find new families, children, and single moms who need our help and support. Then we start offering them our services by preparing food packages for these families based on the size of their household. And uh, I should say that unfortunately last year, Iranian Court of Appeal upheld the ruling to dissolve Imam Ali society and convicted its founders and some chief members. Looking closely at, the, at these legal proceedings, you easily realize that the whole processes have been basically legally and ethically unfair. The main purpose of dissolving this NGO was political, since this group has been fighting different aspects of social injustice in Iran and some other Middle Eastern countries, with Islamic, which Islamic Republic of Iran rec recognized it as legal, illegal protest against it, its integrity. Moreover, economic sanctions against Iran has significantly impacted this community for a long time. That is because despite what is being stated in media, Critical medications have become unavailable or rarely available, and inflation has worsened drastically, which directly affects marginalized communities. However, our family is still alive, and although we are not allowed to officially work anymore, we continue supporting our community and children more passionately to ultimately overcome social injustice, injustice that is now fighting us more strongly. Some of my many family members in Imam Ali society are also virtually present at this event. I would genuinely appreciate you joining me to celebrate them and acknowledge and cherish their precious efforts and concerns for human rights. Ms. Mohamed Reza Kope, Ms. Sara Sadegian, Ms. Nilufar Bagande, and Mr. Ali Reza Taqwai. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Rehana. I think it's so incredible that we're able to bring in the world into this room at this moment. I think there's so much there. And, and for us to also recognize as our school that we are also in different parts of the world making a difference. And I hope that, I hope that they come out soon. Yeah. Um, our next uh, presenter is Rich Tolman. And uh, Matt in the back, we do have somebody. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. 
Yeah. Co-presenter Sam Donald is going to be online, I hope. I can't look that direction because I see myself looking backwards. Anyway, <laughs> such a great honor to be able to be part of this presentation today. All um, our slides are not up there yet. Let me just start. Um, when the pandemic hit, remember that. Um, uh, I was doing some work um, to support father programs in the state and in Detroit, along with a uh, professor at Wayne State um, School of Social Work, Carolyn Dayton. We decided to host a call for people that were working in fatherhood programs that would ha had to make quick adjustments to the pandemic, uh, move their programs online. They were losing staff members. And we started what became kind of a mutual aid group um, over the course of a few years um, with uh, people on the call every week, talking to each other, getting to know each other, supporting each other. And on one of those calls with my uh, colleague, Sam Donald, who's up there, there he is, um, we hatched an idea for uh, an event and I'm gonna advance the slide, I hope. There we go. These are some of the partners that have been involved in our project. We'll talk more about that, but this next slide is our origin story. Oh, oh no, how can we make that play? That's a video that's supposed to play. Yeah. If it doesn't, Rich, if it doesn't play, I can I can uh, use my mouth and use it like a bass guitar yeah, just, and thump it out. Yeah, let's just do that. Anyway, um, do, Sam, did you want to go ahead and uh, tell the origin story or do you want me to get started and then you'll jump in? I'll jump in. jump in. Okay. So Sam and I were on this call I just told you about, and Sam told me about this amazing event that was going to happen in Detroit on base day. It's when all the base players in Detroit get together and celebrate the rich history of the base um, in uh, Detroit. If you want to see some amazing photographs of that day, Nikki Williams was there photographing and they're on our website. Um, and the idea was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the temptation song, Papa was a rolling stone, which, um, and the bass players were going to 50 bass players were going to play the bass line from that song synchronously on the plaza of the Motown museum, uh, where that song was recorded. And Sam and I were talking on this call about fathers and we said, what else could we do? Cause the song Papa was a rolling stone. It's a song of paint, the pain of father absence. And, what happens when a dad isn't showing up um, in his family in the way that the kids would wish that he could. And we said, why don't we tell the story of 50 fathers um, and their relationship to that song or the ways that that song does or doesn't apply to them and how they, how they use that um, to become the kind of dads that they want to be. So um, Sam took hold of this and go ahead, Sam, say what happened next, if you will. What happened next was a wonderful event, everyone. The use uh, with Detroit Music's, um, the organization that I founded, our goal is to use music as prompts to address social issues and just issues and cares of life. So to that, like Rich said, we brought it to Rich and we thought to match 50 for 50 and we collected guys. 50 was the mark. We collected 57 interviews in 20 days. And then there on base day, we, un we unveiled, we introduced the Papa Was Project to the world uh, as the precursor to that base day. And we did that in the form of having four spoken word artists present. And they presented very well. And from then, the Papa Was Project has been birthed and we have been having fun burrowing into fatherhood spaces with the use of music because nothing attracts and nothing is used as a drawing point more than music because music is the soundtrack of our life. And here we are with you all and we're rolling. Yeah. And so, yeah, just to, so to follow up. So we had the base day event. Out of that is going to be a documentary compiling the interviews that uh, we did on that day with some of the story of Base Day and some of the other things we've done. And we've expanded to some other events. 
One just happened. The Fathers of Funny. We had stand-up comics who are dads who do material about comedy and uh, material about their kids in their comedy, with a panel and a talk back about fatherhood in Detroit. Um, very successful. We packed the Detroit theater with over 200 people. Detroit Public Theater last uh, Friday night, February 22nd. Mark your calendar. Uh, dads and ads. We're going to trace the evolution of the way dads are depicted in ads and their cultural influence and shaping, um, reflecting and shaping fatherhood. We have a, a panel prepared for, uh, we're preparing for dads in TV, again, to trace the evolution of the way that fathers have been depicted in sitcoms and other shows over time um, with some other add-ons to that. And then the hopefully the premiere of the Papa Was documentary sometime uh, next semester. Hope to see some of you there. Thanks so much. You know, sometimes to the outside world, social work looks a certain way, but we've already introduced social work through photography, through music, through all sorts of mediums. And we know that. And it's wonderful to know that now others across the state, you know, are also, you know, in, in the nation are recognizing that social work is more than just what they think it is. So that was wonderful. Thanks, Rich. Um, our next presenters are... Uh, the Prevent Team Community, Tahila Zambia, Prevent Team Community, and we have Clancy Lobel. Hi, everyone. My name is Clancy Label. I'm an MSW student who will be graduating this semester, and I'm going to be talking about um, a program evaluation project I did over the summer with a community partner, Tahila Zambia. So a brief overview of what Tehila Zambia is. They are a child safeguarding organization that is based in Lusaka, Zambia. They work directly in building community capacity. So they educate and train both adults and children in um, learning about what child abuse is, how to recognize the signs of abuse, how to respond to cases of abuse, and how to navigate resources related to child abuse and mistreatment. Um, I worked primarily on the PREVENT team, which does this community engaged work. And what we were really focused on over the summer was developing an evaluation component of the team um, in order to track the long-term outcome of their safe places training. And safe places is a three-day training that community members participate in where they learn about child abuse and how to recognize it and respond to it, and also develop a child protection plan for their organization. Um, in most cases, the members participating come from churches, but they also sometimes come from schools, um, sports teams, and even like police and legal organizations sometimes as well. So because Tahila is so invested in the community, and the safe places training is inherently um, involved in building capacity. We knew that in tracking the outcome, we really wanted to seek feedback from those same community members who had done the training. So we organized six community focus group discussions across three different neighborhoods in Lusaka. We got to talk with both adults and with children. And it was a really great opportunity for Tahila to reconnect with the community in a lot of ways. Um, some of the people who came to the discussions had participated in the Safe Places training over five years ago. So it was really kind of amazing that they would show up again and that we were able to reconnect and see what successes they had had, what challenges they had had, um, stories that they had to share to us. And another really powerful thing was that it, it brought a lot of those community members together some of them had known each other previously, maybe they'd done the training together, but a lot of people hadn't previously known each other. And these focus group discussions created a space where people who were very dedicated to the cause of child protection were able to come together and form a stronger social support network. So it was it was really cool and inspiring to see that. There's two examples there, the one in the top corner um, was with adults, and then the bottom corner is with children. Both were very fun to talk to and had a lot of great stories to share. Um, this is just a quote that I really loved from one of the participants. They were talking about 
trying to overcome um, kind of some culturally entrenched values about gender and the treatment of children. And they said, because you know change, change is hard. For people to adapt to change is quite hard. So I believe change begins with a challenge. If you want to change, everything begins with a challenge. Um, and I just thought this really perfectly summed up like how insightful and dedicated so many of these participants were. Um, one of the coolest things that we saw was that a lot of the people who had completed the Safe Places training then went on and took that information and educated other people in their community. So we were able to capture not only what is the, the long-term outcome on this training on the individuals and their community spaces, but we also got to see how information is moving throughout the community, which was really interesting. Um, I also just want to thank the team at Tehila Zambia, who unfortunately couldn't be here virtually today because of a pretty significant time difference. Um, Dr. Masoso Chirwa at the University of Zambia, who assisted on this project. Um, my advisor, Katie Lopez at Michigan and Siwan Sabas for all their support and help on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our students are amazing. Really, they are. Um, our next uh, presenter is going to be presenting on the Ann Arbor City Council Community Engagement and Improvement Work. And Kevin Nguyen, are you? There you are. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'll go ahead and get started on my slides. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some community-centered work that I've done with Ann Arbor City Council, particularly my field supervisor, council member uh, Aisha Ghazi Edwin, who's also an engaged program manager. Um, she's a lecturer here, an alumni of the program. She's also the executive director of Detroit Disability Power, which is a nonprofit in Detroit. Um, which actually leads me into um, one of the, the, the main focus of what I'll be talking about today, because um, it is about a disability justice focused project that um, I did in field. Um, but first to start out with some background on what this project was, it was based off of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. <laughs> Um, and what this act did was establish a lot of really important labor rights for workers across the nation. Um, but there are also some other parts to the act that now looking back today, um, many people question, many states have questioned and responded to differently. Um, and in particular, this um, act, section 14C of the act um, is, is what this project was focused on. Um, and it's based off of the notion or the precedent that there should be a sub-minimum wage for substandard workers who, by reason of illness or age or something else, are not up to normal production standards. And this is a quote from the Department of Labor Secretary um, Frances Perkins, who is actually the first ever female um, Department of Labor Secretary and also the longest serving um, secretary in the Department of Labor. Um, but basically what this says is that people with disabilities should be paid a subminimum wage. And if you look down to the subminimum wage section, um, it just kind of redefines that there should be wages less than minimum for workers who have disabilities. And also <laughs> there's no limit on how little an employee with a disability can be paid. And the way that this operates is that the Department of Labor through the wage and hour division um, will issue certificates for employers who hire people with disabilities to be able to pay subminimum wages. And so with my work with Aisha um, on city council, we responded with a three page resolution calling on the city administrator to advocate to the state legislature to end um, the use of 14C waivers and sub minimum wage in the state of Michigan. It is still legal here. Um, 14 states have banned it in their states and there's a growing number of other states focusing and looking at ending it in their states as well. Um, but the outcome of this resolution of the advocacy to the state is that it passed with no objections. So that was exciting. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, but also there are some really cool things about this particular resolution, um, such as it, as it being the first ever municipal resolution of its kind in the state of Michigan. It also pressures the state to ban the use of 14C waivers and allowing sub-minimum wage 
um, to be any sort of precedent in the workplace for anyone. It also may serve as a model for other state municipalities. There are people on the um, on all over the state of Michigan looking at um, adopting similar resolutions from their city advocacy um, work and things like that. And also it amplifies and reiterates our city's commitment to inclusion and equity for all people. Um, and it reaches beyond just the city of Ann Arbor because it's advocating for the state to end. Um, and we won't stop there because we we do not want this to, to be a practice anywhere because it's unjust, it's inequitable, um, and it's based off of misconstrued um, ideas that are highly outdated um, and research shows are poorly informed. Um, and so finally, I just wanna end off with some other work that we've done in city council that is just community-centered work. That's the overarching um, focus of my presentation. And so here's some other just general titles, some paraphrased of work that we've done. This is definitely not all that we have done um, during my time as a field intern with Aisha Ghazi Edwin and council member Ghazi Edwin. Uh, but I encourage you to check out the Ann Arbor City Government website. You can also check out um, Councilmember Ghazi Edwin's website at Aisha4A2.com um, and sorry, AishaForAnnArbor.com. And yeah, that is all that I have. Thank you, Kevin. Aisha is one of our favorite engaged team members. She's been texting all morning saying, take care of you, make sure he's okay, hype him up. So everybody, we're going to hype him up. Um, but thank you so much. Um, now we have a online and in person. Kyra, you're here in person, right? Oh, both. Okay, great, great, great. Oh, I didn't see you earlier. Okay, great, great, great. So it's not just me. Black young adults' views of what it takes to live on the right side of the law. Dr. Camille and Kyra Smith, come on up. Thank you all so much. We are ecstatic to be here today and talk with you about our project, which you just heard that lovely long title. We won't belabor it, but I do want to introduce myself. I'm Camille Quinn, associate professor here in the School of Social Work. My pronouns are queen, queen she, her, and hers. And I'm joined by my lovely and amazing student colleague, Kai, but I'm going to let her introduce herself. Well, my name is Kyra Smith. I go by Kai. Pronouns are they and she. First semester MSW student. And I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yes. <laughs> so we have the wonderful pleasure to be partnering with an amazing organization called Michigan Liberation. Um, give them a round of applause, even though they're not here. They are awesome. And one of the reasons why they're so awesome is because they're not here because they're pounding the streets, doing the work. They are engaged in daily community and political advocacy. And so part of the reason why we were so excited about working with them is because they engage individuals who tend to be most often forgotten or may be somewhat invisible to populations simply because of spaces and places they've been or experiences that they've had, specifically having diagnosis of mental health disorders, as well as substance misuse or reentering society from incarceration. And so what they do is they train them about what it means to be an advocate in the community. And so part of this project is really rooted on this foundation because we wanted to focus on a very much understudied population, which are African-American young adults between the ages of initially 18 to 25, but we've extended it to 18 to 30. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kai and she's gonna give you a little bit more background about the project. Okay, so that's our first page. That's us, our amazing teams. So, I have some notes um, on some of the amazing things that we've done so far. So we received a small um, planning grant uh, to facilitate community uh, research through a participatory research lens. Um, over the last six months, we have uh, um, gotten about eight folks to join our Young Adult Advisory Board. Um, within that our advisory board, our participants will be trained on research methods. And so we're still... Um, in a bit of like a planning, like a transition pay, uh, phase on next slide, we'll kind of go over that. Um, during phase two, we'll be finalizing questions for our focus groups. 
to support My Lips uh, campaign work. So they have two campaigns. Um, both of them are centered on enduring, ending uh, mass incarceration. Um, so what we're doing is like making research relatable so that they can receive sustainable results for their programming. Okay. So what does this all look like? Well, it started, like Kai said, with the SPG grant we were awarded. We we're very excited about that. Um, we immediately got into a standing meeting process with in my liberation because we wanted to really get to know them and they wanted we wanted them to get to know us so this looked a lot of different ways like in the summer a group of us went on a hike um <clears throat> they actually have been engaged in travel to ghana they spent several a uh, couple weeks there most of the team and they're back now and so what we are planning at this very moment because you see where it says you are here which is where we we are right this is fall term so what we what we've done, and Kai mentioned this, is launch our youth, Young Adult Advisory Board. This is critical to our work because these are individuals who have successfully completed either the Care Not Crim or the Bail Team program. The Bail Team is a very engaged group. They're, that's one of the reasons they're not here today is because they're doing their last push to engage people around this removal of cash bail in the state of Michigan. And so the Care Not crim team is all about care not criminalizing people because they have histories of substance misuse or mental health disorders as well as histories of incarceration and so <clears throat> part of what the young adult advisory board is going to do is really help us push this work and really inform what we want to do so that we are sure that, the, that this is a ground didn't make it up to ann arbor we had to, we had to speak speak Oh, thank you. Thank you. Voices from above. <laughs> so love that. Thanks. So <clears throat> what we're looking at next in December, we're having our launch event where we are actually going to host an event. Some of you might want to join us. I know some of you can't. They're just so important and busy, like our director of the Center for Equitable Family and Community Wellbeing, Professor Trina Shanks. But she'll be there in spirit. Um, we're going to we're planning to hold it. It's somewhere in Detroit because it's just more feasible for our advisory board members and other constituents that plan to attend. But we really want this to be an engaged, enjoyable time that we're going to spend together. In January, as Kai mentioned, we're going to have the trainings where we're actually going to train individuals who are with Michigan Liberation to engage in the research with us. Finally, the IRB is approved. Should put a big old slide up there just to say that even with the certificate of confidentiality that we should hear about in a couple of days, um, because we want to make sure that our participants who engage in these community conversations that we're going to be doing in the next term are protected. Last, we're going to be taking opportunity over the summer and through the fall to analyze, transcribe all of the data that we're going to get. But we're going to do this as a team as well. And so you might be seeing us again at some point as we talk about what we've heard, what we have found, and what we've learned. And with that. Oh, no. Is that it? OK, that's it's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, I love Michigan Liberation. Second of all, next showcase, you're going to be telling us what you learned. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, the next two presenters, I didn't see them at the beginning, so I just want to make sure that, oh, welcome, welcome. So we have Irene Rote. Is that right? Yeah. And then, um, is it just you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So transportation, mobility, safety, and equity for refugee and immigrant communities. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Irene Rute. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the School of Social Work um, in Social Work and Anthropology. And today I'll be sharing the work of the organization Michigan Transportation Center for Immigrants and Refugees, which is based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So MTCIR arose through collaboration between myself and Espor Murandani. Um, unfortunately, Espor couldn't be here today because of his full-time job conflicts. Um, but Espor and I met in 2020 when I was actually working on um, Dr. Gonzalez Benson's research team. Um, and since then, we've collaborated on many different projects. Um, we started a refugee youth council in Grand Rapids, um, and we started talking about 
the ideas and goals around MTCIR um, around 2022, and we applied and received 501c3 status in April of 2023. Um, so the organization identified needs and gaps in services um, for recent refugee arrivals. So Grand Rapids is a transit desert, so there's a lack of public transportation. And even the lines that do run don't run past 11 p.m., so it neglects all thir um, third shift workers. And many of the jobs, um, primarily factory jobs, that are available to recent refugees actually um, lie outside any transit lines um, that do exist. So because of this, one of the first focuses when individuals arrive is actually to save money to purchase a car instead of going to other um, needs that they might have. And then even when a car is attained, driving lessons, driving instruction, materials are predominantly in English and Spanish. Um, cost of insurance is also prohibitory. So all these factors set people up to be at risk or in unsafe um, positions as drivers. So there's the need, um, what's the gap? Um, resettlement agencies give about um, 30 to 90 days of support to recent arrivals and transportation services are very low on the key services that they provide. Um, so in fact, this last week I learned that Bethany, which is one of the um, main two resettlement agencies actually cut a third of their um, transportation staff um, because of 2024 budget cuts. So the mission of MTCIR is to deliver safe, reliable, and culturally specific transportation services to recent refugees and immigrants. Our services currently focus on these two areas, so immediate needs, um, so local transportation to employment and medical appointments, and then um, more sustainable support, looking at providing culturally appropriate um, driving instruction and test preparation services. Uh, we see transportation mobility as a justice issue. So it, um, we see it as really important towards the empowerment of newcomers as it allows greater confidence in meeting individual and family goals. And our goal is that we'll, we'll build community-based transport options that reduce transportation poverty, increase safety, economic mobility, and health access. Um, and as an, a new org, um, we're trying to grow sustainably. Um, so currently we're doing kind of a pilot program. Um, so we have a very, very, very part-time staff um, that transports uh, five clients a day to three different work sites. And so we hope that um, we'll able to gather that data um, and experiences from um, the individuals who are taking part in the services and um, go for some larger grants in the next couple of months so we can continue to scale up. Um, we have a lot of support, at least written support, not funding yet, <laughs> um, from um, the city of Grand Rapids, Welcome Plan of Kent County, um, and also here at University of Michigan. Um, like I said, I met Espoir through um, Dr. Gonzalez Benson's work. Um, she also facilitated us to work with a um, information science program here at UMICH to create our logo. Um, and we also received an Im individual anti-racism grant through the School of Social Work to present a Know Your Rights While Driving presentation and um, a Congolese refugee community event coming up. Um, but yeah, we're always seeking um, new and creative ways to have people and organizations um, collaborate with us as we move forward. Um, so yeah, thank you for letting me present and share our mission, and um, please contact us if you're interested. Thank you so much. Every single presentation, I want to ask like 10 questions, and I'm sure you all do too. So we are definitely going to be sharing um, people's contact information. It is 1.30. We know that the end time was 1.30. We only have two more presentations, so if you don't mind sticking around, we have Zhu Wei, our former intern, who's moved on to her next internship, and we miss her so much. So Zhu Wei is going to be presenting now. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm Zhu Wei. I'm going to talk to you about um, Bright Up from the Infant. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Bright Up from the Infant out. Um, so basically, the idea was um, we worked uh, with the, the age team, worked with uh, uh, sorry, back up. 
Okay, we got this. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, the Engage team worked with Reverend Simmons for a long time, ma many decades, um, on a kind of building another program. And so there was this idea of um, him contracting us uh, because they already had that uh, positive trust and uh, positive relationship. And so they contracted with us to uh, co-design this process, which was right more up. Um, and it was a new program that was going to be reaching uh, rather than just like um, some families, it was more of a neighborhood level, a macro, my mezzo levels uh, change that we're hoping to do. And so we're doing a new program and also a, a evaluation plan as well. And so um, one of the things that we did really well was um, incorporate some of the um, residents and actually one of the people is here with us today. Thank you, Rhonda, for all that you do. Um, so uh, we wanted to let you know that too. Um, she's here and thank you. Um, and also um, the whole kind of project in general is about um, kind of one-on-one -on -one skill building with the caregivers in Brightmore and then looking at some of the kind of community building um, aspects around advocacy for some of the um, the the needs that they have um resource navigation and things like that um and we carried this for the whole semester carried this out for a whole semester or actually a whole year rather sorry all right next um so in in general we were very strategic around how we wanted to um build the community um relationship with the with the partners um and so some of the ways that we did that was um kind of weekly panel meetings um, and making sure that their feedback was listened to um, at the midpoint and throughout the time actually as well. Um, and then we we utilize different kind of resource net, um, tools, both in terms of listening to their own um, knowledge and then also um, kind of doing some best practice uh, research as well. Um, and then we wanted to also let you know one of the cool things that we did and kind of unintended um, kind of product uh, benefit uh, was we were making a marketing video and we actually learned through that some of their own values and some of their own um, kind of reasons for why they're there. Um, and we kind of incorporated some of those into our program design, which was really cool. Um, and then just the other elements were um, one of the things that we did too was the community engagement piece. Um, so after we had this community panel, we were working with them. We wanted to make sure that it was also uh, relevant and interesting to um, the community as a whole. And so we kind of um, held some, oops, sorry, gotcha. Okay, so we, thank you. Um, so we then um, made sure that we had a co-presentation -present in different community cent centers and uh, settings. So that was really cool. All right. There we go. Ah, there's one more slide, though. OK, well, there's one more slide that was supposed to be about um, the uh, lessons learned. So um, in general, one of the kind of things that was really cool about the midpoint uh, evaluation um, that we learned was around um, basically this idea of a lot of people, there's a ton of tension between how we want to. Um, so there's a tension around um, timing. So sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, it's taking too much time. But also the slow process was actually really helpful because as things evolve, um, we want to make sure that we're listening to everyone's voices. Um, and so this kind of tension is actually really helpful. Going slow is, is good. Thank you. Um, and then the other element um, that I wanted to share was um, for the promotional video, um, one of the things we learned too was about making space for people to be their authentic selves. A lot of the times they were sharing stories that they thought that the grant writers would want or the grant whoever people were wanting. Um, and we were wanting them to be their authentic selves and for them to um, share their, their hopes and dreams as well as some of the areas that they're needing some support in. Um, and also the last thing was like utilizing the power of self-reflection to understand the unified goal um, the project um, has and draw together um, a collective why. Um, so that's, thank you so much for all that you, uh, the whole um, en engaged team, and then some of the other people that were here. Um, Rhonda, thank you again. And then all the um, community panel participants and the uh, families. So they were really great to hang out with. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Zue. Um, and also online, Rhonda's online and Destiny's online. So yeah, I, we have two of our community partners online. We're happy that you guys are here online watching. Um, and our final presentation, that went by pretty quick actually, um, recruiting and retaining older African-Americans into research. And we have Dr. Jamie Mitchell.
right. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for those who were able to stick around um, and really appreciate uh, having the chance to share about um, the uh, wonderful folks that I work with in Flint. So I uh, had the privilege of being funded by the National Institute on Aging um, back early in the pandemic, June of 2020, um, to do a community engaged research project with the goal of increasing the representation of older Black adults in aging research. So we know a lot of the discoveries that come out around Alzheimer's and memory care and frailty and heart disease often include majority white participants. And a lot of times we don't know if those discoveries really extend to communities of color um, in terms of being acceptable to them or applicable to their needs. Um, so uh, the federal government does have an interest in diversifying research participation in that way. And I was really uh, privileged to be among a group of folks who were funded to do some of that work. So we knew right from the beginning when we got this funding that we wanted to um, hear the community's voices. We were working in Flint, which is a community that already had experienced a lot of research abuses, um, and they already were very sensitive around, you know, kind of how research is being conducted and whether or not they were going to have a voice in it. And so our goal from the start was really to use that funding in a way that was really driven by the community's needs. So right at the beginning of the project, actually even before the money hit the accounts, we were out um, virtually, because it was during the pandemic, reaching out to dozens of senior serving organizations around Flint and we were trying to build a community advisory board with members who represented the community in aging, in health, housing, um, senior centers, and we were able to bring together this wonderful community advisory board and form our own mini center of centers, if you will, called the Healthier Black Elders uh, Program. Um, so while doing outreach to older adults, especially during the pandemic, was particularly challenging, thanks to uh, the efforts of our community advisory board. And we like to call them also our trusted messengers because we as researchers with the big M brand don't always go a long way in communities that have, you know, don't have a great relationship with research, but because we were able to um, reach out and leverage the expertise of our wonderful advisory board here, um, they were um, able to really bring the community in. Um, and we were able to put on more than 30 virtual events. Now we're doing in-person events and including Alliance Tailgate that we just had on Sunday. Um, we were able to record promotional marketing videos around the importance of Black older adults and particularly older Black men engaging in research endeavors. Um, we were able to put on two, the first one was uh, virtual, the second one was actually hybrid, but two community research symposiums to educate the public about the importance of research participation, doing that ethically, working locally, how to do that in a, a partnership um, style with local researchers. Um, and then we were able to successfully develop and launch a research pool. Um, and so we have just about 150 members, but we really hope to continue growing that. And the purpose of the research pool is to ensure that when researchers say, I want to include Black older adults in this Alzheimer's study or this, you know, um, heart disease study, but I don't know where to find them or I can't go knocking on every church door or every barbershop door. We already have a willing group who's educated on research and excited to engage with local communities or with local researchers. So here are just some of the wonderful events that we have done. Um, the advisory board also uh, worked incredibly hard to develop uh, a professional website um, that shares best practices, not only with the community, but with other researchers around the country who want to do this work and don't have a repository for where to get this type of information. Um, so we've done trunk or treat events, you see. We recorded videos. We've developed a website. And so all of this has really been driven by our advisory board and their expertise, and then, of course, supported by our funding as well. So um, here are just a few of the takeaway lessons that we continue to learn and also share with other researchers that have helped us to build trust um, in the community and the work that we're doing, especially around research participation, um, really being present at community events. So before we did any of our own events, we actually went in and started attending everyone else's events, introducing ourselves, being as supportive as possible. Um, and that, that went a long way toward building trust. Also, we're not asking folks to trek it out here to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, right? If they're in Flint, we're in Flint, right? Um, and so if we weren't able to be there. We hired local folks who live there, who are trusted and well-known, um, and they're the ones who are attending all of the events and doing the recruitment, and they're doing a wonderful job. Um, we certainly involve participant voices, so we have an advisory board. 
Um, we have lots of other engagement strategies that we employ. And then we really work hard to disseminate everything that we do locally. So whether we're doing these lunch and learn events, which is what we call our free community health events, or we're putting on um, you know, summer research symposiums to share back what we're learning and what's happening in the community, we just try to keep that flow of information going. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will hand it over to Trina. Well, really, there's nothing more to say. Just thank you for coming. Thank you to our presenters. Um, hopefully, this will inspire all of us to continue to be engaged widely. And as we go through our strategic planning process, we'll decide how we want to continue to grow our community engagement work here at the school. So thank you very much. There's still food left. There's still drinks left. Take it. And, um, and hopefully, we'll see you next year. <laughs>